is history, the future mystery. This moment is the gift. Every second. Welcome, 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 miracle makers. <laughs> oh my gosh, we got a treat for you. <laughs> We're in rare form today. I'm here with my miracle maker husband, Craig Larson. Yay. Welcome, baby. Thank you, my love. Thank you so much. Woo! We're so excited because we're out on our weekly date. Yes, lunch and date. Lunch date. And we're here <laughs> to share with you this incredible, incredible week, this journey that we're taking, and the blessings of making decisions, mm. good decisions, decisive action. This is the show that we're really going to ground this in. And I'm going to start with a story because this, I didn't think I could be in love with my husband more, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> I have a secret sauce that I don't share with anyone, but it's working very well. Yes, it really, <laughs> truly is. Last week, as we were leaving the studio, mm. um, I had a calling to go to the ladies' room. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we could go back into this 14-acre Sunset Gower studio and walk in, find the ladies' room. Or we could go to Starbucks right across the street. And so I'm like, baby, let's go to Starbucks. I really, th I need to go. And so we go to Starbucks and in the, I use the ladies room, come out. Greg is reading the newspaper. We get in line and lo and behold, the person behind me in line is someone I'd spoken to on the streets a few minutes beforehand, before getting in studio and doing our live show last week. What was incredible was we got into hearing his story, 22 years old, three weeks in the city, no place to go, mm. uh, really sad, really dark. And um, before I know it, we're ordering at the counter and Greg's asking this young man, what would you like to eat? Mm. Well, um, and by the time we're at receiving our order, we're immersed in this amazing conversation with a 22-year-old that flew over from Hawaii that had been offered a job here. And once he arrived, the person that offered the job had disappeared. And eventually, I'm saying, baby, this guy is coming home with us. Mm -hmm. And Greg is like, yes, ma'am. Uh, he's coming home with us. And this young man is it's saying... more like, as you wish, my love. <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, quick decisions, quick actions, quick... I had the desire and to implement a lot of things for this young man. I have also clients, a big list of things to do. And Greg said, as you wish. And we, we brought this young man home... And before we knew it, baby, we share some of the story here. This is, and I'm, I'm going to share why I fell more in love with you and how that happened. Well, you know, he was in a tough, tough place. And uh, when we first started talking to him, he was talking so soft because he was so embarrassed and so, like, ashamed of this, you know, str striking out for Los Angeles to make it in music and just everything fell to pieces and he was so embarrassed and so ashamed and just like out of luck and, and out of options, out of choices. And so at, at once we're, we got our coffees and we bought him lunch and we're standing there putting cream in our coffee and he pulls out this piece of paper and it's, and it's an airline ticket, like a, a price, an estimate. He said, I, I want to go back home to Hawaii, but I don't have any money and it's $242 to go to fly back home. And so, you know, then we went and sat down and ate, and Sarah invites him back to our home. And we only have our Miata, so we can only fit me and Sarah to get back <laughs> home. But he has this suitcase and a duffel bag in his backpack. So Sarah says, just throw your suitcase and duffel bag in our car. We'll take it back to the house. And you just got to, later on the day, take a bus up to our house. So he trusts us. He puts his suitcase in everything our car. Everything he owns. <laughs> yeah, everything he owns. And so then later that night, he comes. And actually, he was asking someone in Hollywood, what bus would it take to get up to the, the valley? And the guy ended up giving him a ride up to our house. 
miracle maker. Yeah, so he's the, yeah, another, yeah. yeah, so he made another miracle for himself, and then he stays the night, and the next morning wake up, and so we we were just asked, you know, what what do you really want to do? Because you came here to do music, and he goes, I really need to go home. So we bought him a plane ticket. That was Saturday morning. He stayed the whole day. He helped us. He helped me reorganize the garage, just kind of like a, uh, to help pay for the ticket we bought him. And the next morning at 10 a.m., I brought him to LAX, and he was off on the plane. And he told me, he goes, you guys were a miracle for me. Yeah. It was so amazing. The uh, Part of the reason that I fell in love is every part of the process was amazing decision-making. Mm. Every part was, okay, what's the next step? What's the uh, the greatest possibility that we can bring forth? Quick, quick, quick. And, of course, he's this young man, 22, speaking in a whisper. Yeah, he had he to lean in. So he was speaking in a whisper. Yeah. You had to lean in to hear him. By the, the time that he left, he asked us to get a gorgeous ring or present for his girlfriend yeah. and really standing in his with strong masculine voice coming through yeah. um, packed suitcase all the way out to the airport I had the desire my husband implemented all of the things to make it happen and so I really recognize you for that thank you baby so much so many times I just kind of throw it in your lap mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'll say baby we need to do this or let's do this and you're such a stand for yes for the decisions that I've made and you make decisions around that and it's, I really got to yeah. witness this so beautifully his energy field shifted so profoundly well, the funny thing was I kept telling him, like, well, I, I didn't keep telling him. I told him a couple of times. He goes, I, I have no idea why we're doing this. Yes. But my heart is telling me to do this. And so, so it, it was like a very profound or deep yes. heart, like, voice speaking through. And it wasn't like, here's the logical sequence. It was just like, just keep moving forward with this. Just keep saying yes. Just, you, you need to help this this young, young person. And, and it was amazing. Yeah. It was really, really amazing to watch from barely there, present to strong young man. Yeah, he was transformed he by wanted. the end. Yeah, in a couple of days. And, yeah. um, we are in studio talking about blessings, talking about decision making, and talking about bringing miracles through that process. And we've got an expert, an amazing expert that drove up from San Diego <laughs> to be live in studio with us. He's such a beautiful human being. And we've witnessed him on stage next to Marsha Weeder talking. We, after learning and meeting him and hearing his stories and learning about the people he's helped. We couldn't wait to bring him mm. in studio. For you guys, Miracle Makers, we want you to make decisions, decisive action, make great decisions, and to sit with someone who does that and coaches that and brings that skill set into those that trust him is amazing. We've got in studio with us... Yoram Balanister. <laughs> <laughs> We're all laughing because he says no one says his name quite right. How is that? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I shared a little bit about you. Say your full name, and then just so it's said, you're, it's such a beautiful name. And My name is Yoram Baltinesto. Baltanesto. <laughs> <laughs> and what did I leave out of your bio or in your description? Is there anything we should add in? Oh, well, I, I typically think bios don't matter as much Yes. as what are you going to do next. Bios, what you did before, doesn't matter mm. as much as what you're going to do next. Woohoo! Because <laughs> <laughs> right? people can change in a blink of an eye. Yeah, really, they? truly. Yeah. And as they change, whatever they bring in from history is to be honored, but isn't as important as what they're going to do next. It's so true. Yeah. One of one of my Sarahisms. One of the things that I often um, take this moment to make the next moment better. 
it's I am an older sister, and so I have younger brothers and sisters that I got to experiment advice on. <laughs> <laughs> and I made them memorize things. I made them memorize. It doesn't matter what happens. It's how you respond to it. And just what you shared there, it is make use this moment to make the next moment better. Mm. That's and, always true, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it's always true. And no one knows what happened the moment before. If When you walk into a room, you walk into a party, what you walk into an experience, you're bringing yourself there. And you're, whatever you share will create what experiences you have in that space and in that room. You always have a choice. What you will do next will create the, the narrative of the future. Yes, what you do next, I can just quote you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another Yoram quote for you, miracle makers. Yes. Um, why do you do this? Why do you get up on stage? Why do you educate? Uh, and why are you so passionate about helping people make decisions? Well, um, that does go back into my bio. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my bio is kind of strange and it has a twist. I was sent at nine years old to university to learn computer science. And the reason that that happened is somebody looked at me, thought, "Ha, oh, that's interesting. This is, this is an interesting young kid. Let's assess him. And they did. And after they did that, they came back. They told my, my mother and father. They said, he's, he's very s smart. He's got to go to the university. He's got to learn computer science. And, and they did. And the good news was I was really good. Mm. I was really smart. They were right. I could handle it at nine-year-old. Here's the bad news. I don't really like computers. <laughs> <laughs> But at nine years old, who would know? They were right. also happy with me, and I was this novelty, and I got all that attention, so that was good. And um, when I found out that I don't really like computer all that much, which was in my early 20s, it was almost, it felt like it's too late. Because mm. I had a degree, I had a career path, I had a job, I had my future laid out in front of me as if I didn't have a choice in the matter. Mm. And it took me 29 years since I realized that what I am to do here is to help people grow and be a better version of themselves and engage in what we call personal development. Yes. And until I could find my way out mm. of a dungeon called high-tech and information technology, which isn't all that bad. It has its benefits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm not complaining because it brought me here and it created a, a financial infrastructure for me, a foundation. But you know what? It took me so long that when I found that door and I said, that's it, I'm doing it now full time, the first thing, when my wife, Shifra, I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about her today. Yeah. Uh, when, she's, when she said, what are you going to teach them? I said, how about I'll talk to them about how it, why it took me 29 years. Mm. Yes. Oh, that's so and, powerful. And so, you know, I'd like to say many of, our, many of our mentors say that. They said, you know, the wounds that we have in our past are sacred. Mm. The mm. wounds that we have in our past are sacred. Mm. Our wounds are what make us unique. The ways yeah. that our heart got hurt or the ways in which our soul um, emerged after that, after that initial hurting or way that we abandoned ourselves in some shape or form. But when we did that, we formed our unique conversation with ourselves. Right. And our scars are our map to our destiny. Mm. Our scars are a map to our destiny. Your scars are unique as well. Mm -hmm. The ways that they come over. Each of us, each miracle maker is, is so unique. And each of us 
is creating the world that we live in based on how we show up in the world. And if there is a wound that you've covered over and um, just let be buried, at some point you're acting out from that wound over and over again every time it comes up. So when others were making decisions around you, because 29 years is a long time. <laughs> yeah, it is. How, how did you show up when others were making decisions around their life? Were you protective of them being able to decide, like your children? You have um, four children. I do have four children. Yes, yes. and when they and were making decisions, we have we have a nine-year-old right now, and I'm imagining him going to college, and we were talking about this last night. I'm like, I, w I melt into tears when I imagine them um, or talk about them going into college or getting married. Not that I don't want that. It's just... It's such a big decision, and it's so precious. You being sent off to college at nine, and you, the decisions that your children are making, how are you? How were you with that? How are you with that now? Well, since you ask, <laughs> uh, I, I do realize that as, as I was making my decisions, and I always had to or my pattern yeah. was really choosing my head over my heart for a long time mm. because that was a choice between what's logical and what makes sense. And mm. I should put double and triple quotes around it. Yeah. And what was the desire of my heart, which would have led me straight back into these wounds that I didn't want to touch for a long time. And so when my kids made the decision, so one child, uh, which is now two of, of the four children, decided to go and, and give back. Mm. One is in service, in active Beautiful. duty, and the other just started a year worth of community service. Mm. And they both did it at the expense of going to college in their due time when, they're, when they finished high school. And um, at first, I, I really did have a hard time with it. But luckily, unfortunately, <laughs> I was right in that period of time where I made my shifts and my changes. And so I could find a way to, to accept it. Mm. It's so important for us to recognize. It's so beautiful. The, I, and this is another thing that I say a lot. The floor is the floor. The wall is the wall the person that's making the decision that we really care about, this other person, our child, our husband, a, a friend, um, a business partner, when they're making that decision, they're coming from within themselves. You, can, you can't change who they are. Like, you can't change the floor, you can't change the wall, you can't change the ceiling if you happen to be in a room. The floor is the floor. The wall is the wall. My husband is my husband. Whatever decision he's making, I've then got to respond to it and allow and recognize how he's making that for him based on his value system. And so that's so beautiful. It is, isn't it? It truly is. The, um, the value system that we have is, is so rooted in who we are. And it's a big question, you know, mm. do, do you think who we are is developed or given? That's a great question. That's an awesome question. Yeah. You know, it all <laughs> depends because, you know, yes. I, 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 where were you born? What, what country were you born? I was born in Israel. Israel, yeah. Because yeah. what, what it, uh, you know, comes to mind is, is you say, you know, you, you followed this choice that was laid out before you. And I just know there's so many billions of people in the world who have no choice. They're in an arranged marriage or their their parents or or their you know their family say you're going to go to college and study computer science or whatever that is and they get into this path and there's if they feel trapped in that or or there's no there's no way to listen to the heart and so for those of us who have this opportunity to listen to our heart we have to like be so mindful and grateful that we have a choice to do that yes. and so like we're almost I want to say you have a responsibility because there's billions of people in the world who have no choice almost. And, and you are 
fortunate enough to have a choice to follow the longings and callings of your heart. So I'm, I'm almost feel like it's almost like your responsibility to do <laughs> that. Because yes. for those of us who are listening and you're, and you're in that same place, we are the lucky ones in that regard. And if, and if you are in a place that you feel like you don't have a choice, where you're in a country or in a place that restrictive parents or restrictive culture, what you do have a choice is how you're showing up. In that, and I, I think back to Oprah when Oprah was mm. in the Mississippi, when she was in th- these television stations, room filled with white men. She really took and embodied what uh, and waited for opportunities mm. where they were asking her to contribute rather than sharing how one should be or how one could be. She shared, she waited for that opportunity. And what I love about Urim is Urim creates opportunities with the requests and the decisions that he makes. He actively and in a safe way, if you're in an environment, look for what you do have the chance to change within the value system. So Oprah in a room full of white men said, I can bring up your ratings, which is within their value system, by shifting our conversations this way. And she got to, because it mattered to them to have higher ratings, to shift the conversations she was creating, the area she did have power in. So if you're at home with your parents or you're in a workplace, learn the value system of those that make bigger decisions than you do and work within their value system to express what change you intend to see and embody that change. Be a champion for that change. Yoram, I just, I can't wait for you to share on this as well. You know, it's beautiful. I, I'm reminded of an old movie that I've seen such a long time ago about um, the lifetime of Buddy Holly. Yes. Mm. And there was this one point where they showed up for their first live concert and they sent them to stage and they were behind the curtain, and then the curtain opens, and the whole venue just quieted down very yes. quickly because it was an all-black venue, and there were these four white kids <laughs> on stage. Mm-hmm. And it re- they really had a choice because mm-hmm. everybody was freaked out pretty yeah. much. And I remember that it's it's it it um it got engraved into my memory mm. that scene where Buddy Holly looks at them, looks at his friends, goes, "Well then, we didn't expect you either. Let's play." <laughs> and his choice at that point was to take what's in front of him mm. and just add the best value that he could, just like Oprah did. Yes, mm. and that's the key. Uh, Because everybody has a choice all the time. Think of uh, Nelson Mandela in jail. Yes. And he was sitting there doing what? You know, taking big stones and making them small. And as he was done chiseling them down to small pieces, they'll bring him another rock. And that's what they did all day long for whatever, decades, right? Decades. And the only choice he had was what is going to be his attitude, what is going to be his, his, his outlook at life? Yes. And what is he going to think and, and therefore what is he going to say? And if you ever watched Invictus, the movie, mm-hmm. he came out of jail and he transitioned from a, um, a person jailed, put to forced labor, into the president, he had all the, I wouldn't say the right, but he had the power to get back and start taking revenge of Mm. the people who represent the regime that put him in jail and that repressed his people. 
and his choice was, no, let's make the best of what we have. Mm. Let's integrate. Let's build this country together. Which is so beautiful because moment to moment with uh, your oppressors or with whoever is in the room, you can be a stand for let's build together and totally trust. Uh, Nelson Mandela w was in communication constantly with spirit, with source, with his, uh, listening to his heart and his inner dialogue. Same thing with Buddy Holly. Mm -hmm. he, he saw the bigger picture of how they fit together. Oh, my gosh. You weren't expecting me either. Neither was I. Yeah. This, <laughs> with humor, this bigger picture, this... Um, the language that was shared there, the actions, and whatever might have been felt in the heart, the fear, whatever that energy was, even for Nelson Mandela, the way th he, both of those he's, presented was always making the next moment better. What can I say to lighten the moment up? Or what can I say to empower myself around what um, responsibility is being given to me now. Right, and, and in, in as much as Oprah went into that room and to use a different term from a different world, yes. looked at what's in it for them and what can I do for them at this point, so was Buddy Holly. These people came here to hear good music. Yes. Let's give that to them. <laughs> and Nelson Mandela, these people depending on what you call this, but the people who put him in power didn't put him in power in order to throw the country into rage yes. and tear it apart mm. over who did whom to, to whom when. They put it in power in order to have a better future. So and let's get a better future. That's so beautiful. We're standing on the shoulders of all those that mm. built a better future. We were driving from the, into the valley, and I was talking with our 11-year-old daughter. It was sort of our date yesterday. We got to go shopping. She's getting ready for school, and she's designing what she's going to look like this year in school. It's just <laughs> the sweetest, sweetest time. She's 11, and she's every decision she makes, there's no deciding anything for her. She decides on her own. And that's been one of the blessings for us as a parent that we can really actively do that. We were coming over the hill and we saw all of these lights and we were talking about, I love city lights because I was born in a village where there was an electricity. Every time I see lights, I get all excited <laughs> and lit up. And my daughter loves nature and she loves horses. And so we always notice this difference. She's like, mom, I want to live in a city where, you know, horses a hundred years ago where horse strawn carriages mm were the norm and it was good for the earth and the, the horses were fertilizing the land as they went along and beautiful things developed out of that. This radio station, I was thinking about this radio station, I was thinking about all of the electricity. We get to stand on Ben Franklin's shoulder mm. because he made a decision to write that, record that, share that. Then um, Thomas Edison with electricity, the light bulb, and each person that shared and progressed it forward we're now able to be on the internet in contact with everything else. And I was sharing that with her and she goes, you're right, mom. I'd take away everything except, uh, uh, except for cars. We'd all be in horse-drawn carriages. <laughs> so we get to spend more time together. And in that moment, my heart made a decision that, wow, I'm gonna spend more time, as much more time with my daughter as possible because that's what she really values, going across these long distances slowly. So we get to integrate and connect, take care of the earth, feel the ground together. Anyway, um, that's... Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that is beautiful. And that came from a conversation with you. We were on the phone with you, and you helped me clarify what was really important to me. And I said, at that moment... I want more time with my children. Mm. This is what's truly important to me is being present in their life. And 
you laid out decisions, you kind of narrowed down the path with how do you make this happen? How do you bring that to fruition? These are the steps, and that came out of a conversation with you. Uh, mo the Mommy and Jazzy date night was beautiful. so beautiful, so thank you. You're um, welcome. I'm, <laughs> just like, <laughs> I'm touched. Yeah, but really. And when I look at the word decide, when we look at that word, decisions are the root of that word has the word side in it, like suicide, homicide. We're killing off choices. D, but, um, the root of the word D is in that direction. What when you truly decide something, you are cutting off all the other options. The other options being cut off is not a bad thing. It truly is. Um, and when you make them quickly, you allow yourself to grow in this direction by cutting off these other options that aren't in alignment with your highest values or aren't in alignment with the path that gets you where you want to go. Exactly. And that's, that's in a nutshell the whole story, isn't it, <laughs> right? Because here's the problem. The problem is we, we are being brought up here, and one of the things that they tell us always is keep your options open. Yes. Well, if you keep your options open, why are we all of that, you know, why is it all, all of that big surprise that we have over 50% rate of divorces? Hmm. And, and why are we, and once we have kept our options open and we get remarried, it gets worse. Did you know that? So the rate of divorce for second marriages is worse than for first ones. Wow. And it gets worse with the third and the fourth. And this is all because we keep our options open. Yes. You know, I'll, I'll marry you as long as you behave. If you don't behave, I have my options open. And that doesn't work. And it doesn't work in relationships as much as it doesn't work in business and in life in general. Yeah. So as you, as you make a decision, which really means you take action, because otherwise there's not much of a decision if you haven't done anything with it. Yes. It's, it's, it may be a conclusion. It may be a thought, but it's not a decision. So as you make a decision and as you base your decision on who you are, on your highest values, just like you said. And a couple of things would happen, right? You, you're not going to argue with yourself even if the consequence isn't going to be what you hoped for. Hmm. Right? Yes. Because you, you could say, I took the best decision at the time and let me take another one right now. Whereas if you make a decision and it's not based on your highest value and a bad thing happened as a consequence... This is when we say, oh, I knew it. I knew I should have done the other thing. Well, if you knew it, why didn't you do the other thing? And as you get to be rooted in who you are, the more you are, just like you did, then you make these decisions that are aligned with who you are, and you're going to navigate your life. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, make another decision. Again, based in who you are. Mm. And I love that. Um, the first decision you've got to make is who are you and who are you going to be? When you decide to get married and you walk up the aisle and you um, say in front of a holy person, this is my choice, this is who I'm choosing, you make these agreements, you take these vows you've decided who you're going to be. You're going to be with this person, your beloved. And the holy person uh, describes that um, as, okay, we declare you um, together. We declare and we as a community recognize that. Mm -hmm. You decide who you're going to be. Then you take the action of getting married you take the that action of standing before a holy person then all of your actions everything all of the future is decided based on who you're being 
and moment to moment embracing and declaring that with every cell of your body, every cell of your body knowing, gosh, I belong with this person. And if there is another thought or impulse, you go back to the decisions that you made and to your being. And then your future is decided by the past. And it's a glorious future based on what you've declared yourself to be moment to moment. Right. That declaration is key. Yes. And being witnessed in the declaration or the vow that you take. Mm. Because yeah. you take that vow in front of the congregation. You take it yeah. in front of the community. And you take it in front of God yes. as represented by the holy person who is conducting the ceremony. Yes. And in, in a big way, you're doing that in front of your spouse-to-be and in front of yourself. So you make a definitive declaration of who you are. And that's so beautiful. And if you made decisions, and I think that happens in marriages, when we're really in first marriages, maybe second marriages, those decisions came from not knowing who you are. And I heard um, Neil Diamond Walsh say this, you know, in my teen years, I thought I was my hair and my car. And then in my 20s, I thought I was my women. And in my 30s, and he goes on to describe all these external things that he thought determined who he was on the inside. And when he really connected with who he was on the inside, all of the decisions on the outside made complete and total sense. And you do have to go back and clean up past decisions based on who you're being in the moment. And moment by moment, when you've decided who you are and, and begin to create in that, let's call it a Petri dish or in that experiment or in that way of being in life, when you, you're you going to try these things out, you're going to know more of who you are and what you want. And giving yourself permission to take risks and make mistakes is really part of the equation of being who you are. Absolutely. And as you root yourself in who you are, if you could just sit down and decide with yourself that there are ways in which you're going to show up in life. And there really, it, there isn't too much to it. There's, there's five, ten things that, that you make these precious little central decisions to who you are. Things like, okay, well, I'm going to do as I say. Sounds like nothing. Yes. But just think about it. It's very key because if you remember, if you just remember to compare the next decision to what you've decided in the past that this is how you're going to engage with life, then you become more trustful of yourself. You become more powerful. And you, you become that person who who does bring about miracles. Mm. Somehow, they, they pop out, out of nowhere, don't they? They do. Mm -hmm. They truly do. I'd love for you to share a story that comes across as a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> that Let me you've choose. Uh. Yes. Oh, thank you. So... How about this one? So the year is 1992, and I took my back then fiancé, today my wife, Shifra, and we backpacked around the world for a year. Mm. Wow. And my decision was, I don't know how, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to pull this off. I want to see Tibet. And when we left and we sat on our, on our journey, it was such a big impossibility because we couldn't get even into China, let yeah. alone Tibet. <laughs> mm -hmm. And as we drove on and about six months into that year, out of nowhere, we hear that China and Israel suddenly have diplomatic relationships. And so we go, okay, well, good, we can go into China now. And so I, I bought 
these books back then in 1992, no internet. Everything was driven by a set of books by, by Lonely Planet. I yeah, recommend yes. them. Yeah. I love them. And I run across this book about Tibet, and I'm, I'm telling Shifra, my wife, I said, I, I don't know how or what, but we're going to get in there. Now, you got to understand that Tibet at that point in time was not really at rest. So there was some civil unrest there. The Tibetans were in, in, in an upsurge in their drive for trying to get back their sovereignty. And the Chinese had it close to foreigners. And so we knew it was close. And I had made that decision. So I read the book and I learn how to, how to communicate with the truck drivers to have yes. them smuggle me across <laughs> checkpoints. And my God, you know, I'm thinking about it now and I'm going, so I was going to mess around with the Chinese police yeah. in 1992. That's, that doesn't sound like a great idea, right? <laughs> Talk about decisions. And <clears throat> we How kept, old were you? We were 30, actually. You were 30. Did you have children? Yeah. Nope. No, no children. children. Okay. Just, just, just her and me. And uh, we kind of inched along and got to a little place out of nowhere, you know, out at nowhere, which is um, um, a Tibetan settlement, which is outside of the borders of Tibet, so inside of China. So we could go there. Mm -hmm. And we get there one night, and I was so determined. I had all the, the maps, the plans, everything, and we, we, we made the night. We slept the night at the hotel, and we went in the morning to have a look at the local monastery. And the monastery is this big square yard with the prayer wheels all around it, and there's nobody there. It's a small place. There's really nobody there. So we start walking around and playing with the, with the prayer wheels. And out of nowhere, we hear from above, from, from behind us, a voice basically says, hey, did you notice that they opened Tibet to foreigners yesterday in Hebrew? Wow. wow. And I look at Shifra, and she looks at me, and we look uh, behind us, and out in that desolated, empty space, there are these two young Israelis <laughs> chit-chatting behind us. And we were kind of like, what did you say? Oh, yeah, hi. Yeah, they, they opened up Tibet yesterday. And we go, well, I guess we changed our plans. <laughs> so we, we dashed. To uh, back to the hotel, took the ten hour bus to the to the railway, took the the one day train to that place, which is basically where yes. the track stops, and another two days on the bus, and there we were in Lhasa, in the middle of Tibet. Mm. Wow, which was a dream come true for me. It was the highlight of our of our trip and the, the first place I'd ever go back to, mm. like in a heartbeat. And if that wasn't, wasn't enough, then as we were sitting there, we spent the, the week, we saw the, 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 the Potala Palace and everything. And then I get this crazy idea and I go, Shifra, instead of going back eastbound, why don't we cross the Himalayas into <laughs> Nepal? <laughs> like it's going to the mall, right? right. <laughs> cross the Himalayas into Nepal. And she goes like, say what? <laughs> and I go, look. There's really only three major places between here and Nepal, which is a thousand kilometers away. So let's just get a bus and go. So we got a bus and we went to find out that the weirdest thing happens in the next city. There's no other bus. There's no buses coming out of it ever anywhere. So we're kind of stuck there. I'm going. I'm not going to go back to Lhasa. That's 14 hours on the bus and in the, in the, in the you know, road fill of yeah. potholes. But we were determined. And then somehow I remember that in the book about Nepal, it says that when you're in Kathmandu, once a week, the Chinese government sponsored a group of tourists who would go and fly into Lhasa and go back over land. And I go, oh, this is it. There isn't any other road, right? And there's only one hotel here that could look like it's sponsored by the government. So let's wait for them. So we wait a day 
and we wait another day. And sure enough, end of the next day, we see this surrealistic picture, right? We're out of in nowhere in the middle of Tibet, and then there's this big Mercedes bus showing <laughs> up with a bunch of of foreigners, Westerners. And I go, are you on the way to, to Kathmandu? They go, yeah. I go, well, can we join you? And they go, I don't know, ask the guide. So I asked, I asked the guide, and she goes, I don't know, ask the group. <laughs> so I go back to the group, and I say, hey, you know, my fiancé and I are stuck here. Would you mind if we join you? And they go, no. And I look at the guide, and I said, they said they are okay with it. <laughs> And so Shifra and I, with our backpacks on a bus full of, you know, German and American and Brits, and we're going over the mountain passes into Nepal. And and again, you know, along that way, on, on the last night, we, they were all, this was an expensive deal, relatively, because nothing is really expensive in the, in the Far East. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we weren't going to pay the prices for the hotel. So on the last night, we we come to the... The first few nights, there were just other people who were kind enough to allow us to stay in their rooms. But last night, it, it didn't work. And uh, we go to the, to the tour guide and we say, hey, you know what? We're going to stay in the bus tonight. She looks at us. She goes, you're going to die. It's too cold. Wow. I go, no, no, no. We're, we're going to put a sweater and we have backpacks and sleeping bags and we're going to stay here. And she goes, you wait here. And she marches off. And we look at each other and we go, now we're really in trouble. Right? <laughs> and she shows up about five minutes later and she goes, don't tell anyone. My boyfriend works at this hotel's. Here are the keys to my room. Aww. Oh. And she was our miracle for that day. Yeah. So, you know, how, how, we did, how did we create it? I, I don't know, but the yeah. only thing that I can say is as we make a decision and we stand in it firmly and act on it, mm. stuff happens. Yeah. Stuff happens. I'm, I'm reminded of this quote by... Um, I am committing a sin. I don't remember who had that <laughs> quote, yeah, yeah. but uh, the quote goes: "Once one is committed, yeah, right." Famous quote. Yeah, yeah. Once one is committed, providence moves yeah. to and all sorts of unforeseen events and material help and yeah. people and support shows up out of nowhere. That it says nobody could have dreamt would come. That's right. His way. Yeah. All of Providence moves once you're yeah. committed. We yeah. had that hanging yeah, in our that's, house. Yeah, we have for that quote too. I forget who that is. Yeah. Um, it's for a, it's a long the guy who led a trek to the Himalayas, I he think. Did. I did. Yeah. He did. The yeah. Scottish, yeah, yeah. The Scotch, uh, Scottish can... expeditions. Yeah, yeah. Sir something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah sir something, yeah. Uh, it quite, quite an incredible. And I thought of this quote The universal forces expects you to be lovable. Hmm. When you accept this with your heart, you become a shower of love for the others and this earth that needs our love. That's Varish. Hmm. And she, your tour guide or the bus driver, became the shower of love because you presented yourself and trusted the universe as lovable. Hmm. For each of us to embody our lovable selves. Mm. And um, it's such a beautiful thing. As you were talking about the bus, I imagine she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. <laughs> <laughs> like you guys all singing these great songs in the bus, internationally sharing the lovability of, of what connects you guys. And Truly, for each miracle maker listening, I'd love for them to have one way to really embody making great decisions. And so, Yoram, what? And we'll come back all the way through. What is one way that you really embody making great decisions? 
to me, it's what I call my personal code of honor, mm-hmm. is as I stand firm in who I am and what are my, you said the most important, I call them the non-negotiable values that I hold. Yes. For me, they are respect, compassion, and friendship, loyalty to people. That, that derives everything else. And as I stand in there, I can make these decisions like, yes, I strive to be my best. I put family first. I do as I say. I finish what I start. I'm committed to lead everyone to be their own self-decisive action takers, and that's what I do in life. And as I have that as a guideline to making a decision, the decisions become very quick, very easy, and very simple. And as they do that, quality of the decision goes up, quality of life goes up, life gets accelerated, you get more done. Beautiful. Mm. Miracle makers, know your non-negotiables, baby. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to go back to Yerm again because, again, it's we're running out of time, but um, it said I think so many people hear their heart wanting them to go in a different direction. They feel that tug of their heart, but then there's a block up here. So what's, a, what's a one thing they can begin embracing the day to help them move from hearing and following their heart and not letting the mind or the ego trip them up with that or hold them back. Remember that you can't have just one-sided life. Mm. If you make all of the decision based on your mind, then you're going to neglect your heart. Mm. If you're going to make all the decision based on your heart, you're going to be unrealistic, if you will. Yeah. You got to create that cooperation. And the most important part is removing that block, maybe, that we have between the two and mm. have them work together. Mm. That is it, the mind and the heart yeah, working together. That's yes. beautiful. Yeah, yeah, maybe find a way with your head to do as your heart wishes. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Miracle makers, I'm going to leave with commitment. Commitment to your non-negotiables and commitment to knowing this is your life that you're co-creating with source, with what created us. Mm. And commit to your life commit to that source and know your non-negotiables you're a ah, thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> for being Pleasure. with us um, thank you for what's having me a treat. we're so grateful and we'll see you next time miracle makers the past is history <laughs> the future mystery this moment is the gift